I'm Carrie. I'm the director here for those of you that are back, those of you that are new. And um, this week we're going to be talking about habits, patterns, and how we can potentially move to addiction. Okay? Um, uh, with drugs. And I'm going to use things like caffeine and cigarettes. How many of you smoke cigarettes? How many of you smoke? You're not on camera, so it's okay. <laughs> All right, so you'll get my gist there. How many of you drink coffee? Tea? Soda? You don't drink any of that. A little bit. Okay. He probably doesn't have a low level legal drug use going over there. But let's take a look at this because when we talk about how we use things, even legal things, and then we look at how we make it into the habit of using things that are not acceptable or legal in society, we move into, we move into the, the way of doing that the same way. Okay. So when we look at a pattern, in my mind, a pattern or a string of things that we do uh, that are repetitive. Okay. You might call it um, a routine. Okay. We all have routines in life. Your Saturday morning routine had to change because you had to start coming here. Okay, so you've had to do something different. We have routines like when you get up in the morning and you get ready to go to work or go to school or do whatever. You have a way that you do that. Okay, my routine is to have coffee first thing in the morning. Okay, now if I'm really on it, yes ma'am, right there. If I'm really on it, I set the pot up the night before and it goes off when it's supposed to. And then my alarm goes off and I hit the snooze because the coffee pot just started. And by the time it goes off again, I can smell the coffee because it's done. Got me? You with me so far? And so then I get up because I know my coffee's ready. And the first thing I do is pad to the kitchen and get a cup of coffee. I'm enjoying my coffee and then I move through my morning. Getting my shower, putting my makeup on, getting my kids up, all of that. So that I get out of the house by the time I need to, okay? I will tell you what, when I run out of coffee or I forget to set it up the night before, my morning goes a whole lot different. Because now my alarm goes off and I go, I didn't make coffee. Do I hit the alarm again or do I get up and start the coffee now? And depending upon whatever's going on, I make that decision right there, don't I? But I'm already behind. I'm already having to do something different because I didn't set up my coffee the night before. Patterns. We have patterns about how we drive to work, don't we? We get used to going one direction, one way, and we don't think about it. You kind of go into autopilot when you're driving around, and it's the way you always go, don't you? And you only really maybe are aware when something's changed, like brake lights come on in front of you, or there's a construction sign <laughs> with bridge closed for four, exit closed for the next four months. Holy cow! Good thing I was aware of that, or I'd be on my way to St. Pete right now, which is happening here this time of year. Okay, so we have routines, we have patterns, ways that we do things. And they're individual for all of us. I don't do the things the same way that Ryan does things. I don't do things the same way that any of you do and you don't do them my way. But we're comfortable with how we do them and our life works because we have these patterns in place. The string of things, the way that we do things. Okay? A habit is subtly different. A habit tends to be a thing. <coughs> a thing, specific, that I do repetitively. Okay, so what are some habits that we can have? <coughs> I use nails. Yeah, biting my nails can be a habit. How about this? Did you catch my yes. cigarette over here? This is a habit, isn't it? We get into the habit of smoking. We get into the habit of smoking or smoking, huh? We get into the habit of having coffee in the morning. We get into the habit of exercising three or four times a week. That's a habit, isn't it? Once I get it set up, then I do it. The thing that's different about having a habit is when, we tend to miss it when we aren't able to do it. Oh my, you know, like I said, when I'm out of coffee, my whole morning is different. <sighs> my day is ruined. I'll make sure I have coffee the next morning because I like having my coffee first thing in the morning. When we run out of cigarettes, my, my smokers in my practice, when they run out of cigarettes, they, are, they know where to stop and get them on their way to work or whatever because there's not about not having them today. No, 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 no. <laughs> I got to fix this problem on my way in. And so I got to take four extra minutes to go in and buy that pack of cigarettes that I don't have. Okay? So these tend to be recurrent as well, but it's a specific thing. When I can't exercise because um, I have, 
I have uh, something else that's, that's more important. Or what about when you don't feel good? And so I don't exercise because, gosh, I just don't have the energy. We miss it. And we're like, man, i got to get back to doing that. So we tend to miss these things more. And when we're not able to do, do our habits, we tend to make, uh, make effort to, re, to reintroduce them so that we don't get out of the habit. Okay? Habits ha tend to happen with effort, don't they? So when you want to get out of the habit of smoking, you have to figure out how to do something else. Huh? Got to do something else. You can't. You, most of us don't just put it down and walk away and never think about it or remember it or miss it or any of that. We do because it was part of our part of the habit that we had in our life. Okay. Addiction occurs when a person builds tolerance and dependence on something. Okay. And these tend to be again very specific things. So a habit can actually become an addiction. Okay? A habit doesn't have to become an addiction though. Just because I ha I'm in the habit of smoking cigarettes doesn't mean that I'm addicted to cigarettes. Just because I'm in the habit of exercising doesn't mean that I'm addicted to it. And you can be addicted to it. People that spend four and six hours a day and it's not their job where they make money at it. <laughs> Probably not doing other things in their life for this huge workout that they do. So we can, we can have good habits to get out of control too. We build tolerance to it though, which means that in terms of drugs, when, when I've been doing my drug of choice for a while, when I, want to look, when I want to get the effect that I'm looking for, after a while it takes more of the drug to get what I'm looking for. It takes more of the drug to get the effect that I'm looking for. That makes sense? It takes more of the drug. We don't tend to see this so much with cigarettes. You know where I see it with cigarettes is when people are trying to quit. And so they'll pull up the list of nicotine content in cigarettes and they cut back by buying cigarettes with less, with less nicotine in them. <laughs> they have that out there and I'm like, so let me get this straight. You're smoking, <laughs> you're smoking a pack of this and you think that's better because it's less? Okay, but you can get themselves off. Okay, people quit drinking liquor because they think they have a problem with alcohol and they switch to beer. There's still alcohol in it. It isn't the same percentage as is in liquor, and so I don't get the effect. Some people go the opposite direction when they have an addiction, right? Oh, beer just doesn't do it for me anymore. I gotta ramp it up here. I'm gonna start drinking liquor, which is three and four and five times the potency of that seven percent beer in that can or that bottle. Okay, so we start to build tolerance and dependence. Now we become psychologically, mentally <coughs> wired where when I don't smoke, when I don't drink, when I don't have coffee, I become very focused on when can I do this again? How will I get so that I can have, get more of what, I, what it is that I want to do? <coughs> there are two types of dependence. There is psychological dependence, that's mental. And so we have, the, we have cravings, we have awareness of this drug that we're using in our life. And then there's physical dependence. And physical dependence means that the body has gotten used to having whatever the drug is in the body and it now is aware. It expects, your body expects to have that in its system like you've been doing it. Okay, part of why we build tolerance is because the body expects this and the body's always trying to be steady state stable. <clears throat> so when I drink alcohol, when I drink a beer in the evening after I come home at night because <sighs> I like beer and it just helps me relax after my day, in two weeks one beer doesn't help me relax anymore. Okay, I have to, why is that? Because I have built some tolerance. That's a, that's a sign that the body has now set a new level of steady state, and guess what? The body doesn't like to live in an altered state. It's part of this tolerance thing. So, it now has a new level of tolerance, and I don't have the effect with one beer, which means if I'm looking for the effect, the buzz, I have to have more. So now I have two, or I have three, or I have a glass of wine that's 11% instead of seven, okay? or I have a, a cocktail, which is more, <laughs> more, depending upon what I have. So there's two types of dependence. Do you always have to be physically dependent on something? No. If you are addicted to something though, you are psychologically. You are mentally dependent on whatever that is. 
Okay. Can you be addicted to a person? Yes. Can you be addicted to gambling? Yes. There are other things in life you can be addicted to. We're talking about drugs here and that's why I'm focusing on that. But I still have this mental dependence, this psychological need to have, to have that, to do that, to interact with that. Okay? You don't always get a physical dependence. Uh, as a part of addiction, when we try to change the habit that we have of using this substance, we experience withdrawal. That doesn't sound nice, does it? Withdrawal, which means the body, the body is now in an imbalance again because I'm not putting into it the substance, the drug that I told it I was going to do all this time. So, <clears throat> I get myself up to a pack of these a day and I decide smoking is not good for me and I need to quit. And so I decide first thing I'm going to do, first time I'm just going to quit cold turkey. Okay, and I walk into my office and you work with me two and a half days after I've had none of these. <laughs> How do I look? Yeah, I may be irritable, I'm going to be moody, I might snap at you, I probably don't look like myself and you have to make decisions about how you're going to interact with me, don't you? Carrie, are you okay? I'm fine. <laughs> what, what's going on, Carrie? You look a little on edge. I quit smoking on Monday. Really? Okay, well that helps me a lot. I'm just going to step over here. Let me know in a week and a half when you're feeling <laughs> back to yourself. Ooh. That's that withdrawal. The, the body, when we're physically addicted, goes, ah! The chemicals in the brain that we were talking about last week are changing. Now they're not getting the stimulation that they used to get. And so my body is changing as I don't put whatever it is in it and we experience it. Psychologically we experience withdrawal when we try to do things whether physically we have symptoms or not. We tend to remember. We tend to be aware that you know this is usually when I go out and have a cigarette. The smoke, the little smoke thing, I got to go 300 meters from the building now because you can't, very, you can barely smoke in Florida these days. But I got to go over there and I usually get to see Bobby and I get to see Jill and boy I really miss talking to them because you know I quit smoking so I can't go out there because they'll offer me a cigarette. You hear me going on? Boy I'm really all into it, right? Not smoking over here? That's what goes on when we try to stop something. We tend to, we tend to kind of focus and we tend to kind of be aware and think about it. That's just the mental piece, the psychological piece. That's me maybe not having any physical withdrawal where I don't feel irritable or jittery or any of that, but boy, this is really hard. Okay? The body is going to try to reset, but first it's going to kind of shake us up and say, you know, you told me you were going to have a pack of cigarettes in your system every day. What are you doing? You told me we were having four beers every evening. What's going on? Okay. <clears throat> With the psychological dependence, use results in a pleasant mental effect. Okay. Lots of times, use of drug is, we use drugs, alcohol, marijuana, to avoid psychological discomfort. So when, when life goes down the drain, if we have a drug that makes us feel better, that helps us relax, we tend to use more. My cigarette smokers smoke more when they get stressed. Okay. My alcohol users, Social, start drinking more when they get stressed. My pot smokers, smoke more <laughs> when they get stressed. Why? Because I chillax. I really just can, can take that break. We don't always tend to think of it that way. We just start doing it. And that's the awareness we have, to, we have to know. We have to be aware of what am I doing? How am I doing it? Why am I doing this? <clears throat> All right. So let's look here at these stages of addiction, just briefly, because it's, it's on our sheet. We talk about stages of addiction uh, in five ways. There is a stage zero person who doesn't, has never used anything recreationally. They have never taken a sip of alcohol looking for that buzz with intent. They have never tried marijuana <coughs> looking for what is the effect, okay? These are, these are non-users. And you hear me starting with alcohol because when we start talking about addiction, that's really where we, I kind of draw the line. I have my cigarette here. Nicotine is addicting. Nicotine is legal. Okay? I, don't get, I don't think I've ever had anybody come in to need a nicotine evaluation because they were making poor choices smoking their 
smoke in their Marlboro, other than that they're killing themselves. <laughs> they're not impacting other people. I haven't had people in for their evaluation because they're overusing caffeine and it's causing problems. Mm -mm. But I have had people in who got stopped driving erratically down the road and oh my gosh, guess what? They've been drinking <clears throat> over at their friend's house. Okay, I have had people that get stopped for not turning right on red or because there was this strange billowing smoke coming out the car window <laughs> and they get, they get picked up for possession. Okay? I get people get stopped for driving erratically and oh my gosh they were taking their they were taking their pain medication that they have a prescription for still driving erratically right these are not stage zero people <clears throat> stage one users are a rare social user that means they don't have any predictability to this they do not have a habit of using it is not built into the patterns of their life and so when I ask somebody that's a stage one user When's the last time you had any alcohol? They may say, you know, I've only tried alcohol twice in my life. I tend to smoke pot when I go out or when, I'm, when I do something. Well, when was the last time you did that? Well, what is now? So now is January and you know, I probably had a little over Christmas because I spent time with my friend and I usually smoke when I do that. And before that, well, I don't know. It's really every now and then. That's a one, that's a stage one. They really don't have, unless it's been recent, they probably can't tell me when they did it, when they, when they used last. Most of us are stage two. You see I have heavy social, heavy social user. What I mean by that is that there's predictability to it. It is being built into the pattern of how we are using our drugs of choice. And so, I, you know what, I don't smoke when I, during the week because I work. But when I'm off on the weekends, I smoke a little pot. I drink beer, I have cocktails, but I don't do it on my work days, okay? so. If today's Wednesday, and I said, well, so when did you last smoke? Well, last weekend. When did you last have a couple of beers? Sunday. They know exactly when they would have done it because they have built it into the pattern of their life. You know, you hear how I'm talking about here and there, okay? which, will, which should tell you that a daily user is probably not a level two person, not a stage two individual. Because the, ha the pattern, their habit of using and their pattern of getting it into their life is far more extensive. When we get to the stage three person, this is a heavy user who may be starting to have problems with their drug of choice, depending upon what it is. Okay? They may be an early addict to their drug of choice. They may be what we call functional, which means they're living their life. They go to work, they go to school, they pay their bills, they are responsible for the things in their life they need to be responsible with and they are using on a daily basis in significant amounts that that stage two, stage one person or stage two person would be truly showing up in an altered state and this individual doesn't. So when we have a functional alcoholic, I have people that drink, they drink every day. They drink from the time they come home until the time they go to bed. It's not unusual to have six or eight beers in the evening. If I had six or eight beers, I would be passed out on the floor, <laughs> but not this person. Then they get up the next day and they go to work and they're on time. They come home, they have their beer. I have pot smokers that are the same way. They don't smoke at work, but they use every day. They have a little every day when they get home because it helps them to chillax because they like doing it because, you know, it's what, it's what my friends and I do. My roommates, we're just all into that. Okay. And they get up the next day and they go to work. I'm starting to see people that are using pain pills that can do that too. That one worries me a little bit more because we have, we have some of these memory issues with people and using narcotic pain pills recreationally. Their short-term memory is not there. Okay? It, goes, it goes away much more quickly. They won't remember something in two or three days that you told them. Whereas you and I would remember like last week. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay. So this is a daily, a daily person. We may start to have health issues here at this stage too. We feel like we get every cold that comes along. The body is beginning to have to struggle with the chemical that's, that's always in it because it's really not natural. It's working on steady state. It's always trying to get you to where you don't, you don't feel it and you don't act on. Okay. But it's starting to have, it's starting to struggle a little bit. And lots of times here, I'll have an alcoholic walk in um, who feels like they have the flu. And when I check their check their blood out, they have uh, elevated liver enzymes, 
Okay? And I'll go, well, and they're, and they're, vitamin, they're vitamin deficient, usually vitamin B, because they're drinking alcohol and not eating as much food. And so they're not getting all the vitamins and minerals that they need. And I'll go, so how much are you drinking? And they'll tell me, I'm like, well, we probably need to cut back and maybe have a little more food. Okay? Sometimes the body will struggle. And unless we actually go see a doctor and they pull blood work or something, we don't even know that that's what that is. Because the body in two or three days is going to go, going to go, okay, I can do this, and it'll try again. Late stage, people turn yellow. <laughs> Late stage, people start having abdominal and digestive things with alcohol. Okay? Late stage, with pot, late stage. My neighbor was a, was a pot user from the 60s. He had significant memory issues and had been smoking. He smoked every day that I lived next to him. Um, but so he'd been using probably 35 years when I met him. He couldn't remember. He couldn't barely remember stuff from day to day because he'd just been smoking a long time. It was catching up to him. A stage four user, you would, you would look at me and say, that's an addict. That is an addict. And we tend to think about what drugs with addicts. Or doing what as an addict. Shooting up certainly would qualify as going, God, that's a drug. That's a druggie. That's an addict over there. Who puts needles in their arms? <laughs> that's because you and I wouldn't think of doing that. <coughs> Heroin, we tend to put that one in there. We, don't tend, to, we tend to put methamphetamine in there because it doesn't take long to get to that one. Cocaine, I have some stage three, but most people still kind of look at that one and go, crack lives down at stage four for most people because it doesn't take long before really life at stage four is not about living life it's not about having a job it's not about being responsible to me or to my family or anybody it is about me getting drug when can I use again how can I get more can I take he's got a nice watch maybe I can get that off his arm and hock it <clears throat> you know oh you know, if I'm careful, I, I learn how to lift from people so I can catch your wallet. I can catch, you know, we're doing those kinds of things at this stage. We're panhandling with our little sign, hungry help. <laughs> Have you ever tried giving them food? They don't want food. They want cash. Right here. Because they're going to go out and usually a large percentage of them are going to buy drugs. They're not going to eat. They're going to go buy drugs to feel better. Okay. Those are the, those are the stages. Clearly, we are, not, we are not at stage four here. I don't think I have any stage threeers here. Most people that I deal with are at stage two. They're a social user who's using a little bit more. Something's happened and they have to, we've increased their awareness to say, I need you to think about this. Okay. The process of getting there though is, is kind of interesting because at some point in our life and usually early on, we got exposed to a drug. Lots of times it's alcohol or marijuana in the families that we grow up in because those are the drugs that we predominantly use here in the United States. Okay, and so if your family uses alcohol and you're a little kid, okay, you may have been offered alcohol or you may be interested because you see somebody drinking it and they act a little bit different and you go, gosh, I wonder what that's about. And so you go sip on it and you get that first buzz. The younger you are, when you get your first buzz, your first high, increases your risk of going on to having a drug, a, a drug issue as you age because of how young you were when it started. Doesn't mean that you will. It's a risk, not a predictor. Predictors mean, you know, you got that and you will. No, it's a risk. <clears throat> and here's why. With our first drug experience, we begin to make decisions about drugs. Okay, so the first time, I'm coming back to my cigarettes, the first time I tried a cigarette, I was nine years old. <clears throat> there was a girl that lived in my neighborhood that was older than me, and she was already smoking. And I had found out she was smoking. <laughs> and she didn't want me to tell. This was her motivation for me to try cigarettes, because then she had stuff on me, right? Well, you did it, and I'll tell on you if you tell on me. So I try cigarettes. Now, I'd also seen my dad using cigarettes. So they're around in my life. My dad smokes. This girl that's my age smokes says, don't you want to try one? Well, she's got one in a lighter, and we go out back. And I go, okay. And I take a drag off of this thing like I'd seen my dad do, because you all watch these people smoke, right? When you're little, did you ever watch them? I mean, I'm not like, <laughs> not like, let me see how to do this, but I'm just aware. And so I'd seen my dad go, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, and he doesn't cough. He does it, and he looks great. And I'm thinking, you know, this could be, this could be it for me, nine years old, right? And so I go, Ugh! 
<coughs> I thought, I mean, I coughed and coughed and coughed and said, ooh, I don't like that. So it was a long time before I ever had one of these again because, gosh, that was terrible. That was terrible. And so I'm going down that unrewarding line there, aren't I? This was not rewarding for me. Coughing up my left lung was not it. I said, ew, I don't want to do that again. I thought I was going to die. I saw stars and got sweaty and lightheaded. Ew, okay. And so guess what? At nine, I didn't feel I need to do that again, okay. We have alcohol around in our lives and we try it and get our first buzz and that's kind of cool, okay. If it's rewarding, it increases the likelihood that if we have access to it, we'll try it again. Whether it's this, a cigarette, or pot, or alcohol, <clears throat> or that pill I saw laying on the counter, okay? If it's rewarding, we're more likely to, to, to use it again when we have opportunity to, okay? Now this is a, this is a stage one person, isn't it? Rare social at this point, why? Because I don't have a supply. I don't have any pattern. I don't do this on a regular basis. I do it when I have the ability, when it's available to me, but I don't have, I don't have a way to do that with any predictability. The younger we are, the less likely we are to have predictability. As we flash forward and we get into high school, now we have a little more ability to get stuff, don't we? Add your heads, yes. <laughs> I know I'm older than you, but the answer was yes when I was there, and so I know the answer is yes now. Sure, because your friends may already ha be smoking pot and know where to get pot. And they're already smoking it, or already drinking alcohol because they've seen it in their family and they were, they've been using since they were 13, okay, and now we're 16, okay? So I have the ability to get more as I get older. You move out of mom and dad's house, you have friends, now you don't even have to ask. You don't even get in trouble with anybody when you, do, when you smoke or drink now because you're over 18, right? So now, as I have rewarding experiences, I will use more. Now I may have to go buy my own. May have to go buy my own stuff. How long can you bum cigarettes off somebody? These are about 25 to 40 cents a piece, depending upon what you smoke. Okay, and so I might lend you one. <laughs> Here, I'll give you one today. But you know, if you're every day bumming a cigarette off me, I'm gonna say, you know, why don't you, why don't you buy the, here, give me $4 for this or whatever. Buy mine, go get your own, you know, especially with pot, really. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep supplying you, no. <laughs> I'm gonna hook you up with somebody that will, okay. People come, people will say, I'm going over to so-and-so's house and I bring my own beer. Because they don't have what I like or because, you know, they, I, I, because they, they won't give me any. Which tells me that I've used a lot at your house and <laughs> I need to start bringing my own, you know. Okay, so the more rewarding it is, the more likely we are to use it when it's available, the more frequently I use it, now I have to be able to supply my own stuff. So now I'm spending money out of my pocket, right? Taking money out of my budget, taking money out of my paycheck to buy stuff, okay? The brain all the while, the body's going to try to stay steady state and adapt so that we don't live in this high state all the time. That means, dang it, I got to use more. Okay. And that's where we'll, depend, we'll develop dependence and tolerance. In the middle of this chart, I have uncertain. Uncertain. There are some things that can play into uncertain. I told you about my first cigarette experience and that it was really nasty. Okay. And most people that I talk to, occasionally I meet somebody who really enjoyed their first cigarette. Okay, and they're up to a pack and a half a day, a lot of them, because they enjoy them so much. But most people didn't. And yet I meet people who had that first cigarette and it really was unrewarding and they smoked cigarettes. Why? Why would you ever go back and do something that sucked when you tried it the first time? Why? It might have given you a feeling, but you're more likely to do it because you're getting pressure from your friends. Oh, come on. You were like nine years old when you did that. Try it again, it won't be as bad. Okay, and so lots of times we have this peer pressure coming in. We have friends that are smoking. We have friends that are using alcohol and we wanna fit in. That can be a big, big push to try something again, to get over that I really don't like this and be able to smoke without coughing. 
be able to drink without going, ugh. It's an acquired taste. Okay, well, if you practice enough, try it enough, you will acquire the taste. And then you will begin using. So we may use it if we're uncertain. The other way that it can be uncertain is we know we're supposed to feel something. I know I'm supposed to get a buzz drinking a beer. I didn't feel that. It must take more for me. <laughs> it's never a good sign. If it takes more for you to get it, stop. It's not a good sign. Okay? But if we're uncertain, you know, I'm supposed to feel something there. It's supposed to do something. That's, I see it with other people, and they seem to enjoy it, and I don't get it. Okay, we're more likely, we may try it again if it becomes available, but I'm going to use more next time because I know I did, I did one and it didn't, I did one beer and I didn't feel anything. So maybe I'll have a, maybe I'll have some vodka. Maybe I can feel it with vodka. Maybe I'll have a big glass of wine. Okay. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have a blunt instead of a joint because there's more there. I don't know. Try more because I want to, I want to feel it. I'm interested, but I didn't get it. I don't know. I got my friends pushing on me. Come on. Some of us, when we're with friends that smoke, puff, puff, pass, if you do that. It gets them out of rhythm when you just pass. Wait a second. You didn't take none. Pressure from our friends to do like them. We may have to change our friends if we don't want to do that. First drug experience, who am I with? Was it pleasant or not? Repeat drug use if it's enjoyable or undecided. We may try it again. Peer pressure plays in there. If previous drug use has been rewarding, if I smoke cigarettes or if I smoke pot and now I can't smoke pot, okay, I may try cigarettes. Why? I already smoke. I already know all about that. So I may trade or add using the same mechanism that I use for my drug of choice. Okay. If I've been exposed to alcohol and marijuana, and I'm at a party and some white powder comes out. Well, you know, I already, I already like alcohol and I already like pot. I'm willing to see what this is like. Lots of times we're already in a semi-altered state using our drug of choice and that makes it seem even better. This is really a good idea. Look at me. Not. <laughs> it's not a good idea. <laughs> Don't do it. Okay. Frequency picks up as we begin to use more regularly. Now we take this thing that we like, and instead of it being occasional, without any kind of predictability or pattern, we begin to build it into our life. I don't know one cigarette smoker that hit one and started with a pack the next day. Okay? We slowly build it into the patterns of our life. So when I start smoking cigarettes, you know, at first, I was only doing it when I went out on weekends with my friends. We would have a cocktail and we would have a cigarette on Friday. That became predictable, didn't it? Stage two. Then I went out with a friend of mine at lunch who I used to hang out with on Fridays. And after lunch, we're sitting out and she whips out her cigarettes and her lighter. And this one you could smoke in Florida. And she starts smoking a cigarette. And so I'm, I'm like, oh, can I have one? Now I'm starting to link. I take this cigarette, this nice meal, this wonderful, this wonderful friend that I'm enjoying spending time with, and I add, boy, that cigarette, boy, that cigarette got a lot better. So now when I go out to lunch, it doesn't take but two times of that. And now after I eat lunch, even on my own, I pull out a cigarette and I start smoking a cigarette. So now I'm smoking every day after lunch. I just went from two or three cigarettes a week to a half a pack. That didn't take long, did it? You know, and then I'm doing something one day and I'm with a coworker, and they say, you know, I'm going to go out and take my smoke break. Why don't you come along and we'll keep talking about this. And so I go out by the little smoke thing. And I have my own cigarettes because I smoke a half a pack a week now. <laughs> so I bring those along. And now I have a cigarette or two while we're still talking about this thing we were talking about at our desks for that 10-minute smoke break. Gosh, that was kind of nice. I really enjoyed that break. You know, I think I might, I might do that. So I don't do it every day all at once. But give me a month, and guess what? I'm taking my two smoke breaks a day. I'm having one to two cigarettes with my smoke breaks. I'm having a cigarette after lunch. I still have my two or three when I go out on Friday night. I'm up to over a pack a week now, and I started out with two or three. And this is how we build it in. We begin to put it into places with, that we're having, we're enjoying, or I'm having stress, and I, you know, I'm going to go out and have my smoke break. I have a cigarette because it helps me calm down. I had a bad day at work, now I'm smoking in my car on the way home. I mean, there's all kinds of ways we build these things into our life. 
but we do it fairly benignly. Am I thinking about any of this? No, I'm not going, you know what? I'm going to work my way up to a pack and a half of cigarettes a week. I'm going to make that a goal. Did you hear me say that? No. None of us actively do that. People do not go, you know, I really want to spend that kind of money on cigarettes a week. But we get there and we go, God, how did I get to this? Well, I smoke, on, I smoke when I get up. I smoke on my way to work. I smoke at my smoke break. I smoke at lunch. I smoke at my break. I smoke on my way home. I smoke in the evening. I smoke when I go out. Man, <clears throat> and I like the good ones. So $78 a carton. That's 10 packs. That's a two-week supply. So I've, I've got myself up to $40 a week almost smoking cigarettes. And I can do that in a couple of months. You can do that with pot too, can't you? You can do that with alcohol too, can't you? You can do that with pain pills, can't you? You can do that with Xanax. Any of the drugs that we feel the effect with, we can build them right in. and get, get ourselves into places that we didn't intend to get. And we get there because we're making choices and not paying attention to what we're doing. And then when I have to stop, it's like, oh, oh my gosh, <clears throat> this hurts. This hurts. <clears throat> so I want you to think about, think about your use. That's what you're here to do. Think about where you were, what you're doing. Is it what you want to do? Were you in a place you didn't mean to be? Okay. And finally, here's my little Chinese proverb. First, the man takes a drink. That's you trying something for the first time just to see. Then the drink takes a drink. This is us building it into our life. We think we got it all under control here. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm good. Then the drink takes a man. This is me being addicted, having tolerance, putting it into my life in big ways, and I'm not in control anymore. I'm going I'm to have issues now. <clears throat>